Hi, listeners. Welcome to It's the People, our interview series where we explore the inside story of building companies and investment portfolios with high-octane founders, limited partners, and fund managers. We really hope that these conversations push you to be even better at what you do. My name is Wills Hapworth, and this week, my partner Andy Greenfield and I had the opportunity to interview a fascinating leader, Dan Rosenswag. In 2010, Dan became the CEO of Chegg, an online education platform that provides textbook rentals, homework help, online tutoring, and other educational services to students. Under his leadership, Chegg has expanded its services and grown its customer base, going public in 2013 on the New York Stock Exchange. Prior to Chegg, Dan was the COO at Yahoo from 2002 to 2006, overseeing the company's global operations. In addition to his work at Chegg, Dan serves on the boards of several other technology companies, including Adobe and Rent the Runway. He has also been involved in various philanthropic and social causes, serving on the board of directors for the Silicon Valley Education Foundation and as a member of the board of trustees for the Harlem Children's Zone. During our interview, we discussed a range of topics, including his perspectives and advice on networking, particularly as a person who has built a truly exceptional group of people around him. His views that you ultimately have to bet on the inevitable of where the future is going. His philosophies around decision-making and the job of a leader and being fully committed. His views on what failure actually looks like. His mantra about finding the best way to say yes, and much, much more. Before we begin, we'd like to note that this interview is for informational purposes only and that the opinions expressed should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. TIA Ventures is a seed stage fund focusing primarily on early stage business to business technology companies with an obsessive focus on end customers and early teams. Dan, we have four hours of stuff. We're gonna move hard and fast I'm riding up on a ski lift about a month ago, and I talk to people on the lift. And I say to this guy, you know, we're talking, and he mentioned something about college. And I said, I was up at Colgate. And he said, oh, I went to Hobart William Smith. I said, oh, let me do it. Do you know? And I say, uh, Dan Rosenzweig. And he goes, oh, yeah, I knew Rosie. He ended up, you know, doing pretty well. He was in my fraternity. But to be honest, we never thought he'd amount to much. Now, my question, Dan, coming off of that one is, obviously he was wrong. Was there a pivotal moment, a thing that happened, a piece of serendipity or epiphany that kind of took you from, eh, we never thought Rosie would amount to much, to, you know, obviously a guy who's achieved a great deal of success? Well, I appreciate the introduction. And I agree with whoever that individual is. So um, you can text them. If it was a fraternity brother, I think we all pretty much thought we would not amount to much and because we didn't know what much meant. Because you have to realize that was 1983, and I'm not sure any of us really understood. That was pre-internet and pre-really the very beginning of personal computers. And, um, and if you weren't going into finance or real estate or advertising, really was not much to do. So... Um, Look, life is not an epiphany, as you know. An epiphany is the moment where your life experiences add up to the point where you're willing to be courageous and do what you probably knew you already needed to do. And from my perspective, when I was at college, like a lot of people at college, especially back then, but also today, you go without knowing what it is you're supposed to do. What is college? What's its purpose? And back then, I'm not really sure any of us really knew what the purpose was. So you went and they taught you stuff and your assumption was the stuff they taught you was supposed to make you employable. Then one day you wake up and you find out at your graduation that your mom and your stepfather's marriage is not likely to work out. And you're handed a book that says, these are your college loan coupons. And here is your car payment coupons, and uh, you're on your own now, um, good luck. So you can call it an epiphany, you can call it desperation, you can call it an example of how life actually works. Things come at you that are entirely unexpected, 
And it's the way you respond and react to them that determines where you go and if you're happy about the choices you make. And so the reality for me was the house that we lived in was going to have to be sold and I was going to have to find a place to live and I needed to be able to afford a place to live. It's just that simple. And so from there, life hits you in the face, you get up and you say, all right, well, life can happen to you or you can happen to life. And so at that point in time, I was determined to never be um, somebody that needed to depend on somebody else for my life. And that now, that what that led to was a determination to be financially independent and to be able to make my own choices, recognizing that there was no net to catch me. And um, so that was the basis of accepting reality for what it is, which is a series of events that happen and you've got to deal with them. It, so I would, I would say that's the beginning of it, if that makes any sense. And, and Dan, if you take it another step, because I've listened to a number of the interviews um, that you've done and you have this concept of, I think, brilliant by accident. Yes. And yet you look at the arc of your career and I'm not saying it's all worked out, but you've made some great decisions. You've had just like such a tremendous business mind. You got this, you got this big, you know, yeah, call it bucket of cold water thrown in your face coming right out of Hobart. And somebody in your same position might have had, you know, a very different, maybe, maybe they were as resilient, but would not have had the career that you had. Like, where did the business mind that you have come from that led you to making, and we don't have to go through, you know, all the things that you did because our listeners can Google you and, and see, but like, you've just had such a, did you know you had it when you were in college or did it evolve? You know, like, where did it come from? Because yes, you, you, you demonstrated tremendous resiliency coming out of school, a desire to be financially independent, and yet you like went on to do incredible things, be curious and, you know, make difficult decisions and have an openness to learning. Did that all come from a, a place? Was it always there? Um, no, it was not always there. I'm sure many of your listeners feel uh, a sense of, um, of trepidation about making decisions, about feeling like every decision they make is the most important decision they possibly could make and will permanently determine their future. Um, that, you know, they have an identity crisis and a crisis of confidence. Let me just be clear. I feel all of those things and felt all of those things and still feel them today because your ego gets in the way. Um, and what I would say to you is resilience for me was about recognizing that you really only have two choices when you're screwed. And my mentor, Bill Campbell, summed this up for me later in my career when I was at Chegg, or I'm at Chegg, before he passed away. But looking back on it, it was always the way that I acted, which was when you feel like you're screwed, you have two choices, quit or shut up and do something about it. So the path that I took as the grandchild of immigrants was recognizing that every day, even when I walk by the Statue of Liberty, which I often do here in New York City, because I live by it, um, is to recognize that at some point, my grandfather at about eight years old stepped off a boat and that's what he saw. And so how could somebody in my position ever think that it's too hard or quit? Because I can't even imagine what that must have been like. And actually it's a driving point for me because I had grandparents and great grandparents. My great grandparents didn't speak English, but all they did was they thought America was great. They thought the American dream was great. And so I always believed in the American dream. And I know that sounds sort of sappy, but it really did feed me. And is anybody that does Google me, and I'm not sure any, why anybody would, and don't use image search, please, um, that um, you know my entire life has been <laughs> been written by Bruce Springsteen. So. You know, if anybody listens to Bruce's music, then you know it's about life is hard, but there's always hope. One day we'll walk in the sun. Life is hard. But till then, 
maybe we were born to run. There's hope, but you got to keep going. And, and so I think I was fueled by this reality that quitting just isn't an option. They're really, the definition of failure for me at this stage of my life, when I look back on it, is not whether or not the choices I made were good ones or bad ones, or worked out or didn't work out. It was the choice to get up and make another choice. That means you never fail. The only way to fail is when you just quit. You say, whatever has happened to me has won. And I just can't allow that to happen. I just, I, I, I can't be the son and the grandson of who I am and think that that was an option. And you know, you were mentioned earlier about brilliant by accident. What does that really mean? I have had the very good fortune of having grown up in the technology industry, which really defines our world today. So I've met just about every founder that we envy or hate or wonder how they did it and have been in conversations with them and have met with them and have tried to buy their companies and, and have been beaten by them and have competed with them, every aspect of it. And the one thing I learned is at one point they all have doubts. And the second thing is once they shed those doubts, they fully commit and they actually have no idea how it's going to end up. They just know that, that their job is to remain relevant and reinvent, reinvent, reinvent. So, you know, all those people have shown me the way that's brilliant by accident, which is Mark Zuckerberg had no idea that Facebook would become this or their next iteration of the metaverse or that there would be AI or that he would end up buying apps that weren't even invented yet, like WhatsApp or Instagram. There's no way that he had that on his roadmap. And so for me, a lot of these decisions that people make, they go, oh my God, they're geniuses. They were brilliant by accident. They had absolutely no idea. Read Phil Knight's book. He had absolutely no idea what that swoosh would become. How could he have? How could Mark Zuckerberg have known he was going to connect 3 billion people? He didn't. I've known him since he's 20. He had no idea. And so the things that I've done, I didn't know whether they were going to work or not. But you pick a direction, you fully commit, and you figure out how to make it work. It, it, you know, it's interesting hearing that. And also just a little sidebar, I think of like, you know, life without a net. You know, you describe your... Uh, parents, grandparents, etc. You know, arriving with no net, and um, and that's a lot of how you've moved forward. You know, you know, part of what I think of you, Dan, and we have known you since the day you knocked on that door when I was mentoring a group of Colgate entrepreneurs. Um, right. and God bless it, you for doing it, because you know what? That's how these young people get confidence: is when somebody who's seen the movie can help them understand that there's always another chapter. There's always another scene. Well, thank you for saying that. But when I think of you, I think of a guy who sort of embodies the Nike, just do it because, and I'm going to talk about two, two uh, sort of venues. I've seen this happen. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, it doesn't hurt know. that my closest friend is now the CEO of Nike, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so you you come in, you see this program that Willis and I are doing, and without blinking, you step forward. You're not a Colgate alum. No. You step in, you fund a summer incubator, which truly makes a difference. It gives like, you know, kids who are showing promise fuel for lifting off. You then say, and you came up with this idea. We didn't. Uh, you say, you know what? There should be a capstone event at the end of the year, but to really make it a capstone, which was, it was kind of a shark tank and a conversation. We need to put people up on the stage that are going to fill the auditorium. That's right. And you, without blinking, all of a sudden we've got, I don't know, three or four hundred billion dollars of market cap up on the stage. And you did that multiple times. And then I think of you in the board of trustees, where, as you know, there's lots of talk. A lot, you know, a lot of wind, not so much trees blowing, and you had a reflex of this is a problem. Let's do this thing. You know, the sane nurses, um, 
etc. Yeah, the rape kit. Yeah. So, yep. so as opposed to let's talk about it and have another meeting about it, you know, three months later. So you have this bias towards action. Yeah. And I'm, can you talk a little bit? Because most people, for all sorts of reasons, are afraid to take that step, whether it's fear of failure or whatever. You, you see it, you do it. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from, but, um, and it doesn't always work out. And, uh, I, you know, not everybody loves it. Uh, but I do have a bias for action because I believe in people. And I believe that, um, that if you give people confidence, if you show them that somebody values them, and if you show people that things can get done, but talking about it doesn't really solve the problem if you continue just to talk about it. And, you know, one of the lessons I had that sort of gives an example of that is when I was at Guitar Hero, and I remember coming into Guitar Hero my first week, and I called all the senior managers together, and I was trying to understand, like, where we were. Um, never been in video gaming. I had not. I'm a music buff and love music. And um, we had Guitar Hero 5 that was coming out and it was going to compete with Beatles rock band and people were panicked and we're inventing a new um, product called Band Hero and then we are DJ Hero. And so I said, look, what is the biggest issue that we're dealing with now that is causing us not to be able to succeed in your opinion? So what you always look for as a CEO is where are the areas of leverage that if you can clear the path, you can accelerate growth. And believe it or not, it was an argument over whether or not to call the band hero game Guitar Hero Band or Band Hero. And so I said, how long have you guys been talking about this? Three months. Three months. And what is that holding up? It's holding up packaging. It's holding up how we talk to artists. It's... Um, and, and so we're sort of stuck and it's holding up our ability to talk to Walmart, which were the distribution channels and a lot of things. So I'm like, okay, how many of you three months ago wanted it to be band hero? A bunch of people raised their hand. How many of you three months ago wanted it to be um, guitar hero band? A bunch of people raised their hand. How many of you changed your time, changed your opinion in 90 days? Not a single person. I said, okay, what does the CEO of Activision want it to be called? Band hero. Great called Band Hero. Next. They're like, how could you do that? I was like, because 100 days of conversation led you nowhere. At some point, the magic is not, is not the decision itself. And this is something that I've learned over the years. And my good friend, who, as I said, now is the CEO of Nike, really brought this home to me many, many years ago, maybe 20 years ago. Um, leaders need to make decisions. But by its nature, something that hasn't been done before or CEO level decisions by their nature are 50-50, meaning if it was an easy decision, somebody would have made it. So the magic isn't what the decision is. The magic is making the decision and then convincing everybody to figure out how to make that the right decision. So... You can't possibly know whether band hero, guitar hero, band is going to be the difference or if it even matters. So the issue was, okay, we've made that decision. Now, how do we make that name successful? So I did what any smart person with daughters would do. I signed Taylor Swift. And guess what? Game sold out. <laughs> because the issue wasn't the name. The issue was getting everybody behind making band heroes successful. Mm -hmm. And and so from my perspective, that's why I have a, a bias to do because I have learned that exceptionally smart people, of which I do not count myself among, can see something from every conceivable angle. And the problem is they see everything from every angle. And when you see everything from every angle, it's really hard to make a decision. But if your bias is towards to solve the problem, whatever decision you make, you'll just adjust it along the way when the facts come in, when the actual facts come in. And that's the way that, that my bias is to get things done. Like the issue is, well, you know, on the rape kit, I have two daughters at that college 
I'm looking at the numbers. I'm not okay with it. No one on the board was okay with it. You included. And the answer was, well, it's expensive. Well, how much? Well, we don't know. Well, then how do you know it's expensive? And what if we paid for it? Well, turns out you need a nurse available 24-7. Great. What does that cost? And aren't there three other schools in the area that will have the same problem that we can work with? Yes. Great. We'll pay for it. Next. The idea is to remove people's excuses to not make a decision. So you've got to be more confident in making a decision than they are confident in trying to block a decision from being made. That's, I love the notion also of like smart people can see it from every angle. Um, I'm guilty of that at times of just, you know, the paralysis that comes from that. Um, I understand the fear. I just can't worry about it. When you have, when you have a responsibility to get something done, yeah. you know, you know the, the best example of, of they don't have time to overthink stuff is, no matter how smart they are, mothers. <laughs> Suddenly one day a child comes out of you and for the rest of their life, they're going to be connected to you. Yeah. They don't have a lot of time for the bullshit that us men get to think about. That kid's got to eat. I don't know how to feed it. Well, you better figure it out. <laughs> right? Honestly, they're the single best examples of how to get things done no matter what. Dana, you, you've mentioned a few names already of people that you know, that we know you call friends. You're a magnet for exceptional people that surround you. You know, just in our experience, I distinctly remember, I think it was all that same year, MC Hammer, Brian Chesky, all got on a plane, came over here, sat on the panel, Shark Tank style, met with our sophomore, junior, seniors in college who were building businesses. And they did it, you know, I, I think it seemed as though they were having as much fun as anybody you have this amazing network. Can you help us understand how you've cultivated it and then how you seem to be able to activate it and make asks of people, but not in what seems like a, you know, a needy way or I need you, you know, I have, I have friends that make asks of me where it's, like, it feels like it's using and it doesn't seem to be the case in your world. And given the people that you've been surrounded by, just help us understand how you've done that. Yeah, listen, I, I I feel blessed to have people in my life who um have hearts bigger than their their brains and bigger than their net worths. Um and I I I cannot explain enough of the gratitude that I have. To your point, how do you ask an MC Hammer or an Ashton Kutcher or Brian Chesky the week he becomes a billionaire running Airbnb? Um, or Jen Hyman, the founder of Rent the Runway, or um, Sheryl Sandberg, right, who just wrote Lean In. Um, how do you ask these people? And the thing is, um, I've known almost all of them before they became what they became, um, with a few exceptions. And it's because somehow or another, my lens on networking is different than other people's lens on networking. So everybody gets told by their parents or their professors or their bosses, network. And people hate to network because it's nerve wracking. Like, how do you walk up to an Andy Greenfield who created successful businesses and ask him for something? And, um, and so what I learned a long time ago is most people assume that networking is transactional. It's a means to an end. I never viewed it that way. I viewed it as who would I love to have in my life that I love them enough to want to be in their life? And so the network itself is the end. It's not a means to an end. And the fact that those relationships 10, 15, 20 years later turned out to be the people I was fortunate enough to meet and surround myself with became these incredible successful people had nothing to do with it at the time, but their positivity, their energy, their thoughtfulness, their generosity attracted me to them and made me better and wanted to do things for them. And so the people in my life 
They're not professional network friends. I have those people and those are more transactional in nature. Hey, can you do this? Sure, but I'll do this for you. And that's okay. That's that's just good business and it's good life. But the, it's, it's about surrounding yourself with people that you genuinely care about the outcome of their life and that they genuinely care about yours. And how that amounted to the network that I have, I, I can't really explain it except to say, I'm so blessed to have it. And, you know, it ranges from people who, you know, are very well known and billionaires that, you know, have gone on to crush my success in business and um, to people who used to be my driver when I lived in Silicon Valley when I needed a ride to the airport, you know, who live in Idaho now who text me every two weeks because the thing is I never cared about what you did. I cared about who you are. And people never cared about what I did. They cared about who I am and what I tried to do in my life successfully or unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. And that turned out to have been a blessing for me. Yeah, I distinctly remember somebody saying, well, you can't, I can't, I couldn't say no to Dan um, during one of those weekends. And, you know, I, I think Andy and I feel the same way. I can't put my finger on why, but if you ever called us up and needed something, I think we'd just say, of course, like, and, and yes, you've done amazing things for us, but it's not, it's not necessarily about that. It's more the feeling of who you are or that you've created in our kind of minds and our hearts about like what we would want to do for you in that sense. So. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I think one of the things that I learned a long time ago was, you know, the concept of mitzvot, which is just do good for good sake. And, um, you know, my, my, my grandfather, um, the one I mentioned who came over from what I thought was Russia turned out to be the Ukraine, um, you know, sold auto parts his whole life in the Bronx until the business went bankrupt. And he always had this thing where if he was sitting next to young people anywhere in the world that they traveled to that were Americans and they were young, he always bought them lunch. And it was because he just feels so grateful for America. And so my version of that is if you can do something for somebody that is trying to improve their life, why wouldn't you just do it? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the harm in just doing it? And the hope is that you want nothing in return. Because if you want something in return, that's okay. That's a transactional relationship. There's nothing wrong with that. That's business. But sometimes, especially with young people who are trying to advantage themselves, who are trying to get out of where they are to a place they want to go, who don't know the path, you know, all they need is, a, is one person to give a shit about them and to, and to support them. And it's amazing the things that they do. And they end up blowing past you in your career. And isn't that awesome? And so that's the way I think about it. And it served me well. I mean, do I get taken advantage of? Sure. But it's okay. Because more times than not, the joy of seeing the outcome. Why do these people do it? They do it because they know I wouldn't ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do for them. And more importantly, that isn't really in the spirit of who they are as people. The people that I brought to that school genuinely care about young people and their education and their future, and they don't think that they're so important that they can't. Mm -hmm. They think that they're they think that they're so blessed that they should. That's great, hey, Dan. I'm curious. You, you mentioned a, a number of stories already from childhood or early memories. Are there any others, or is there w maybe one other that really stands out, shines brightly that you think? played a big role in the chart, you know, the path that you, you, you know, went down or that you're going, still going down. I think there's probably a few pivotal, pivotal moments that, um, I think stay with me all the time. And, and one of them is actually a result of my liberal arts education at Hobart and William Smith. And again, you know, both my daughters went to Colgate. So I'm a big fan of liberal arts education, recognizing though, that it's incomplete now. It is necessary, but is not. It is not complete. That it needs to expand the catalog of what it does, because it needs to be more relevant to the modern society of what is rhetoric, and and um, what is philosophy. Uh, it evolves. It's not looking backwards now. It's looking right into the mirror and saying, "What the hell is AI going to do? 
what are our ethics and how do we use it? And and so I just don't think it's modernized, but but the con concept of of allowing people to try to understand how to make decisions. So in college, one of the pivotal moments was I was in a world politics class and um, you know, this is when we were in a cold war with Russia, which we seem to have returned to, but it was around the time where you could still fear nuclear weapons and and all of those things. And the professor said, okay, all of you are the president of the United States. You're Mr. President, Madam President, and I am the Secretary of State. And I walk in and I say, Madam or Mr. President, the missiles have launched. What do you do? Well, some of the class said, get into the bunker. Some of the class said, launch back. Well, the answer was to ask who launched them, how deadly are they, and what are our options? So it was to learn to ask questions before you make decisions. You may not even know what the question you're asking may lead to, but simply by asking good questions, you can learn a lot because the exercise turned out to be we launched them, they were test missiles, and it was just an FYI that it was successful. But we had half the class blowing up Russia. So that has stayed with me forever, which is be really good at asking questions. And that was reiterated in the conversation I once had with Colin Powell, which I can talk about later if you want, about why he made the decision to launch the first Iraq war 12 hours earlier. I had the very amazing honor of meeting with him and the fun of getting him drunk so he told me true stories. Um, the second one is just an example of, of when I took the Yahoo job. I had spent my career up to 40 years old being brilliant at articulating why I would say no to great opportunities. And people have said to me, Dan, how did you know to say no to all these things and say yes to the right one? I was like, I appreciate you thinking so highly of me. The truth is I said no because I was chicken. I was afraid. I was afraid to fail. I was afraid to mess up. Better for people to assume you're capable of doing it than prove that you can't. And so I turned down so many incredible jobs in my career uh, because I was afraid. And I rationalized the genius of how to say no and make myself feel good about it. And that was a giant mistake. And it wasn't until I was 40 that I learned the power of learning to say yes and take risks. And the thing that got me over the finish line was the, the great Terry Semmel um, who said, Dan, do you want to be an 80-year-old guy sitting on your front porch in Scarsdale, New York, saying, what if? Or do you want to be a 40-year-old saying, this is how we're going to change the world? Which person are you? Like, I had no good answer for that. And so I took the risk, cut my salary in half, took a bunch of equity, moved my family to California where they didn't want to go, and took on the turnaround of Yahoo. And... Um, that moment stays with me because when people say, what, do you, what are your regrets? I was like, I don't have any regrets because life is like the game of Jenga, which is if you pull any of your regrets out, your whole life may tumble. So there's things that I wish hadn't happened, but I can't say I regret them because here I am today at a place that I'm grateful to be in with a wife of 35 years and two incredible daughters and a, a, a series of friends from high school in life that I love and love me. And so if I pull them out, the whole thing might have collapsed, even though I wish they hadn't happened or embarrassed by some of the choices that I made. Um, but what I learned from that is be the person that figures out the best way to say yes to an opportunity, not the genius that finds out a way to make yourself feel better about saying no. Because life's about saying yes. Can't get anywhere saying no. You get a lot more places saying yes. So that was the second valuable lesson for me. And the third one was, again, the late, great Bill Campbell, where the company wasn't going well at Chegg, and he was dying of cancer, and he called me up one day, and he said, Dan, I want to see you. We should take a walk. And I was like, oh my goodness, if you're feeling well enough, are you coming up to the building? We'll have it all hands. Everybody will want to see you. And you can read about Bill Campbell in the book, Trillion Dollar Coach. Um, it's about him and what he did for all the amazing founders and uh, CEOs in Silicon Valley, out of the generosity of his heart, never took a penny, by the way. Um, 
because he was a football coach who became a billionaire. Uh, and I said, he said, no. I said, would you like me to come to your house? He said, no, you can't. I said, well, where are we going? And he said, well, we're going to take a virtual walk. And I said, oh, and where are we going? He goes, we're going to go behind the woodshed. Now, for those of you who are too young to know what that means, the woodshed used to be where parents took their kids to spank. So I said, oh, shit, do I leave my pants on or take them off? And he said, leave them on, but you're going to feel it. And he said, you know, the thing about leaders, Dan, is they lead. Leaders can't go to the left or to the right. They got to go forward. Because otherwise, where are people going to follow you? And he said, the other thing is leaders need to be fully committed. If you have one foot in and one foot out, life's hard enough. But if you're not fully committed to trying to do something, it's impossible. And he had heard a rumor that I was leaving and that I was going to take my dream job, which it was my dream job since I'm 10. And he was like, you can't call yourself a leader if you quit. Leaders don't quit. And so you need to put both feet firmly in. And I'm like, you know what? Every time I leave myself an escape route, I don't succeed. Every time I say there's no escape, it's my job to fix it, I succeed. And that came from the late, great Bill Kim. I love that. <clears throat> you, you know, I just want to take a, before we get into education and the state of education and your crystal ball there, I, I just want to go back to your network for a second, Dan, because I, I think of, you know, I sort of contrast it to, you know, oh, I've got buddies from Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, you know, JP Moore, et cetera, et cetera. You're, we got to see sort of like a slice of your network. And to call it diverse is kind of an understatement from having, you know, CEOs of Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 25 companies to, a guy who's in his first year as he's a rookie pro football player. And okay, we've got a, an actress, we've got a rapper, we've got, I mean, it just, it was, it was like, what's the common theme there? So how did, you know, how does it get like that where it doesn't look like, well, this is sort of out of central casting. This looks like it's out of, you know, a Jeopardy category, odds and ends for 30. You know, kind of, <laughs> so how did it get like that? I have absolutely no idea. Um, one of the lessons in life is life is serendipity. I mean, it truly is serendipity. And if you try to be the person, I'm not always successful and I'm not always good, right? Let's just be honest. Um, but if you try to be somebody that does good, good things can come your way. And, you know, how did I meet these people? Uh, some of them came to meet me when I was the, COO and president of Yahoo because I had this sporty job and and they wanted to meet me and some of them worked for me and and blew past me in terms of their careers and you know if you take MC Hammer it's actually hysterical because um, my wife would go away for the summer and like like most really uh, successful allegedly successful men could not take care of myself when I was alone um, and uh, and so I got invited to meet the the president of a booth, you know, Chicago Business School at a, at a friend's house in Silicon Valley. And I said, no, I don't really want to go. I said, well, wait a minute, you, you're serving food? He said, yes. It's like, all right, I'll come. Because feeding myself seemed like a very difficult task for me when my wife was gone for the summer. So I went and I'm in the line to get food, which is the only reason I came. There's this gentleman sitting next to me and I, and I put up my hand and said, hi, I'm Dan. He said, hi, I'm, I'm Hammer. I was like, Hammer? Like MC Hammer? He's like, yeah. I said, oh my God, I'm Dan Rosenzweig. And he said, Dan Rosenzweig, Ron Conway has been trying to introduce us for years. I'm like, what? How do you even know my name? And from that day forward, just became friends. And um, no particular reason. Or, or a former employee of mine was like, look, I want you to meet this guy. He's trying to understand how to build a business. And it turned out to be Ashton Kutcher, and I didn't want to meet him. And and um, and I said, fine, I'll do it for you because of everything you've done for me. And but I have to meet him at seven o'clock in the morning because I have to get back to Silicon Valley because we're is in Los Angeles. And we ended up spending five hours together, and I'm like, this guy is so smart and so kind and so genuine. Like I'm grateful to be in his life. So a lot of the people were either just ended up meeting them by accident, or. Um, 
or people who know me put me together with people that they thought we'd benefit from knowing each other just as people. And the thing that I've learned is like a marriage, like parenting, you really got to keep earning your friends back every day. You got to care. So I never go more than two weeks without calling or texting just about every friend in my life from high school to whatever. And sometimes it's just, hey, checking in. No particular reason. And what I didn't realize was how important that was to them. Because when I stopped doing it, because they suck at it, <laughs> I like got calls. Are you okay? <laughs> so, you know, we all care that people care about us. Our egos obligate us, if we're being honest. And so a lot of what I do is because selfishly, I want people to care about me. And I realize that's an that's a insecurity that I have, um, you know, as a result of my father having left at three and my stepfather having left at 23. Um, and so I work very hard to be a relevant and valuable friend to the people in my life. And, and it's not because I'm a great guy. It's because I need them in my life. Hmm. I think I wrote down a New Year's resolution this year, which was along the same lines of just like stay in closer touch with the people that I care about. I've done a better job, but not not nearly at the level that you do. What's the downside of telling people you care about that you care? Zero. It just how do you, I mean, I'd love to understand how you as a person who is as busy as you are running a public company. I mean, it's you know, horrible you know to say, how do you have the time? But like, how do you have the time to do it all? So Will's, I, everything you just said is an excuse. Mm -hmm. We've all got 24 hours in the day. We just choose to use it how we choose to use it. I don't even have to use that many hours. Like I go to sleep and like everybody else did. Now I say Yahoo, I didn't. Um, and it nearly killed me physically. But it's what you choose to fill your hours with. And so my view is when people choose not to do something, it's for a couple of reasons. They don't understand it. They don't value it. Or they're afraid of it. So if you value those relationships, then you'll do it. If you don't value those relationships more than you value sitting in front of the television and doing nothing, then that's what you value. Never, never ask a CEO what their priorities are. You know how you know what their priorities are? Look at what their budget. Look where the company's actually spending its money if you want to know where their priorities are. Mm -hmm. It's not what they say, it's what they fund. And so in life, it's not the number of hours. It's everybody's busy. I don't know anybody. I have my daughters that are feel more busy than me um, trying to make their career and build their relationships with their fiancés or their boyfriends and their friends at work and try to make their rent payments. Like th there's more stress on their life than there is in people in my position. And and so um, it's just a matter of choice what you choose to prioritize. Dan, something you said, uh, and I hope, hopefully you heard it right when you told the story about Bill Campbell, was that you were thinking about leaving for, quote, your dream job. Yeah. And I'm just curious, because I wrote down as we were preparing for this interview, I think about Chegg, and you're a person that has just been deeply passionate about education for as long as I have known you. And I also see you as a person who loves to do things and enable things and build platforms that kind of lift people up enable them to realize the best version of themselves. That to hey, me Will, feels like- Can I ask a favor? Will you talk at my funeral? <laughs> <laughs> but that feels <laughs> like- it's my wife and daughters. They get a very different Dan. That feels <laughs> like it's Chegg in a nutshell. I wrote down, is not is Chegg your life's work? How could there be a dream job beyond, you know, and obviously there's more chapters that you're going to write, but like Chegg feels like it's the perfect place for you. Well, first of all, let's split that into two, which is, I don't know what my life's work is. Check's my job and it's my passion, but I hope that when I'm gone, there's more of what my life was than just that part of my life. Because, you know, as somebody whose father left, I really would like to be a great father. As somebody who's the product of a mom who was divorced twice, I'd really like to be a good husband. Um, as somebody who is the beneficiary of the American dream, I'd like people to believe that they had a chance at the American dream because our lives crossed. There's a lot more I'd like to feel like I am than the job. But if you want to talk about 
what could be a dream job versus the job that I'm in. Um, at the end of the day, founders, entrepreneurs, and executives think differently. So a founder is somebody who their entire life's work is the invention that came out of their head that they convince other people to invest in and create with them and grow it. And it's just extraordinary when it's successful, like a Facebook or an Airbnb or you know any of those companies that we talk about, Amazon or Apple or whatever. An executive is somebody who's very high up at a company, makes a lot of important decisions, manages a lot of people. But at the end of the day, they can move on to the next executive position because that's what the expectation is. An entrepreneur, which I believe that I've become when I got to 40, was somebody who switches from executive and says, no, this is, this is mine. This is me. This is who I am. And even though I didn't found it, I'm going to refound it. So by the time I leave, it's going to be better and representative of what I believe, where we should go and how we should act and what our values should be. And most of my friends are refounders. They're running companies where they've created more value than the original founder did. And shockingly, that happens more often than you think. Um, so, so I don't know what a life's work is, um, and I'm not done living life. And and um, and so we'll see what the scorecard is at the end of what people interpret me as. But the thing that would cause me to leave what I am would be related to the fact that what I would have done would have been informing and educating people. And what I love is to give people tools. If you're willing to raise your hand and not bitch and do the work, I'd like to be somebody who gives you the tools or the confidence or the backing to be able to see if it, if it plays out the way you want to play out. So it has to have those characteristics. But after I, have you to, I have to tell you, Wills, telling your daughters after you've been the CEO of Guitar Hero and, time, and signed Taylor Swift and signed Eminem and Jay-Z, hey, girls, guess what? Dad's quitting to rent textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not the easiest of conversations. Let me just put it. Hey, Dan, just on the topic of education, and I've heard that concept from you about the re-founder, um, which is so interesting. Although, I, you know, just a small tangent. I kind of think we're all refounders, like great artists, great musicians. They kind of copy and steal from everybody from the past. Maybe we're not truly founders. Well, I wouldn't put that in the category of the refounder. I would put that in the category of people that that have influences and put their own stamp on those influences. And and those are creative types. And I think they're magnificent. A refounder is somebody who the original idea isn't theirs. But they're now tasked with taking where it is to where it needs to go next. Uh -huh. And they either succeed or they don't succeed. Oftentimes, new CEOs come in when something's gone wrong. Or when the founder has reached an age or a point where they just don't want to do it anymore. And it's just a different world. Yep. J just on, because it sounds like you at some point could have become an educator and you work in the education space. You had a concept of education. I have the largest educator in the country. More yeah. people use than anybody else. So well, and you bring edu you bring education to the consumer, which is a concept uh, you know you talked about. Like we're used to the Uber coming to us, the class now can come to us, mm -hmm. and yet you know we've we've all worked in education in various roles. Why is it that education always seems to lag? the trend? Why are they always seem to be the slowest adopters? If you think about that concept of like bringing education to you, to the consumer, why are they so late to the game? So what are the common elements of people that move slow? They're the incumbents. They're the people who benefit from the existing situation. And the natural instinct of any of us is to protect what we have so, you know, Terry Semmel, when he became the boss of Yahoo after 25 years of being the chairman and CEO, co-CEO of work, you know, where he made, you know, every Tom Cruise movie and The Matrix and The Batmans and like that guy, talk about influence and power. And, you know, Steven Spielberg referred to him as Mr. Semmel and I referred to him as Terry. And that was very odd for me um, that 
he used to say that whenever anything new was invented in Hollywood, the first person in the room was the lawyer. And that whenever anything is invested in Silicon Valley, the last person hired is the general counsel. And because one of them wants to change the power dynamic from the incumbency to somebody else, and the other wants to protect the power dynamic. So look at the way higher education or education is set up. Look at the way every government institution is set up. Every one of those people has a secure job and took that job with the expectation that the hours that they were going to work were going to be the hours that they work, and that there's very little risk to them. So why would they be the ones accelerating taking greater risks? It's not who they are. It's not why they chose that profession. And one of the things that I learned when I was a publisher of the largest computer magazine, which at the time was called PC Magazine, why was I one of the few people to be able to move from traditional media to the internet early on and have some level of success and the rest weren't? It wasn't because I was smarter. Again, brilliant by accident. As the publisher of the largest computer magazine in the world at the time, well, guess who the first people who were going on the internet were? Computer users. Guess what kind of content they were seeking first? Computer content. Technology. Buying a printer. Buying a computer. Buying a modem at the time, right? These were... So I was at the front row of people saying... The traditional way doesn't work for me. I'd rather do this way. And so having sat on the front row of that, it became clear to me that you got to bet on the inevitable. So if you're in higher education, you don't want to cut costs. You don't want to reinvent. You don't want to have to change the way you teach or what you teach. You like the power dynamic that says we're in charge, you are not. Well, in that world, Che could not succeed. Because going to the school and the administration and asking for their budget to determine what it is the student needed to help them devalues what they do. Mm -hmm. So we said, why don't we go to people who are putting their hands up, need the help, historically have not gotten the help, make an incredibly high quality, incredible value, really inexpensive, and make it so it works for the person that we think should be at the center of the, of the education process, which is the student themselves. If you look, all the curriculum that was sold to schools didn't even talk to the student. It was sold to the administration or to the professor. If you look at why does somebody get to charge $3.50, the average student takes out 10 bucks from the ATM machine. $3.50 is one hell of a vig. That's a Sopranos episode when you take that much money from somebody. <laughs> Why? Because they care about making money and the school cares about making money. Why did the bookstore give a commission to the school? Why did the school say that financial aid that the school gave you could only be spent at the bookstore for learning material that was the most expensive rather than renting it? It's because they're designed to protect what they have. So the decision we made was really one of no choice, which is we care about the person that's actually paying the bill. Mm -hmm. We care about the person who's actually trying to advance their life through the education. We care. And so all of our questions were, what did they need? So when we told schools 10 years ago, they needed to go online and they needed to create hybrid. Why? Because 70% of the people in this country go to state schools. They don't go to Colgate. And Two and a quarter million people in the state of California alone go to community colleges. There's 115 of them at the time that made sense. Put them in your local community. But your local community now is the internet. Why should I have to take a half a day to take one 50-minute class when I could be either raising my child or earning income? Why isn't it completely online? How does the state of California have the audacity to ban the ability to get a full four-year degree online? Because it's trying to protect its school system, not trying to serve its student. So the reason is because all these institutions are invested in what is and what was. And until there's an incentive for them to invest in what should be, they're not going to change. Well, Dan, since, since you've been a guy who's been kind of on the leading edge of revolutions, well, the tech, technology-related revolutions... If we ask you to look in the uh, the Rosenzweig crystal ball, and it's five years from now, 
and we're saying, what does education look like now? Given the you know questions about you know is eighty thousand bucks a year for a liberal arts education worth it? And, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Online learning. What's it look like five years from now? Well, I can tell you what the students are telling you that it looks like. So if you don't get into the top branded schools, the top 50 schools, of which Colgate is, of course, one of them, um, you're not trying to get into a lesser version of that anymore. You're going to big state schools. Why? Because they're saying with their time and their money, education is a commodity now. Doesn't matter whether I get it from here or there, if it's not one of those branded schools that have these incredible networks of people that will hire you because they went to your same school. So they're going to giant state schools and the enrollment at those state schools going up. They're going to the big football schools and the big basketball schools and big sports schools. So you're like, shit, I'm going to party and have a good time because it doesn't matter if I got university, if you never heard of me or some middle road college here because it's liberal arts. Students are saying that. The other thing that's important to understand is the demographics of this country are getting older, not younger. The average age of a college student in this country is 25. 40% of them say they work 30 hours a week or more already. 26, 27% of them already have children. This is shocking to people that go to Colgate or to Hobart or to Harvard because 2,000 people go to Colgate 170,000 people go to Southern New Hampshire University online. This is what America is doing. That's the first thing you need to understand. So hybrid, online, relevancy to making you employable. You don't go in that direction and you're not one of the top 50 branded schools. I don't think you make it. And I can work out the economics to prove that to you. The second thing is... AI is changing everything. So I was not one of the people that got on the NFT bandwagon. I was not one of the people that got on the crypto bandwagon. I certainly got on the blockchain bandwagon because the easiest way to explain blockchain is anybody who's ever deposited money and they tell you you can get 70% of it available today and the other 30% will be available in five days from now. Blockchain solves that. You should be able to get access to all your money immediately. So... That's just a record keeping, bookkeeping ledger. But I never really got the NFT crypto craze. The last big technological revolution, in my opinion, was mobility. And in 2004, I made a speech that said, people are gonna want what they want, when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it, and the device they choose to use. This is before the iPhone. Because it became very clear to me that the internet was the cloud and whatever device we were using to access it is what we were going to want as broadband became more and more prevalent back then. So it became very clear to me on the front end, I just want access to my stuff on whatever device I use. And I was a big BlackBerry user back in the day before the iPhone. Um, so with AI, I had the, the privilege, I guess, opportunity to sit down with Sam Altman um, again, talk about network. I met him when he was 19 and we stayed in touch. No particular reason. He was wondering why Combinator. I didn't need why Combinator, but he's just a brilliant young man. And, and I was happy to be helpful whenever he needed it. And I never knew that he was going to end up inventing open AI and chat GPT. How would you know that 19 years later? Right? So, um, so one of the other folks who actually came to Colgate, the three of us sat down um, for two and a half hours talking about what it does now, what it's capable of doing, what they want it to be capable of doing. And it caused me to, to reimagine my entire company and my entire user experience in ways that I didn't even know could be invented, let alone were being invented. And that is sort of frightening. So I interviewed him, which if you want to attach, it's only a 15 minute interview. If you want to attach it to the I podcast. saw it. He's in, he's in the car, right? It was he's great. in the car. Yeah. Uh, um, I asked him, what should we be scared of? What should we be excited about? And if you were an educator, what would you be teaching people right now? And then I asked him a very difficult, well, they're all difficult, but I another question. I was like, 
would you recommend people go into engineering now, now that GitHub can write your code? And these are white collar jobs that things coming after. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know what it's going to affect, but we know it's going to affect things. And so if I were in the education space, I would be wanting to understand not only what can it do today, but what is it likely to be able to do? And how can I prepare the people that I'm responsible for to prepare them for their future to leverage this capability rather than be run over by this capability? It is not going to eliminate humanity or humans. It is going to operationalize and commoditize certain capabilities that people used to get credit for. By the way, the history of technology in the world has always been that. One of the things that makes me feel slightly better is the fact that we have more people in America than we've ever had before, and we have the highest employment rate we've ever had before. So despite everything that's been invested, that, that invented that put people out of business, there's more jobs now than they've ever been. And so the hope is that's what happens with AI. But if you don't know how to leverage it and utilize it as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a marketer, as a CEO, as an educator, it's entirely possible that you are going to be left behind at a pace that we have not really imagined before. So according to Sam, there's a whole bunch of things it could do that it hasn't rolled out yet because he doesn't think people are ready, ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> and like, uh oh. Um, and when I asked him, would you would you recommend somebody learn how to be an engineer? His answer was extraordinarily diplomatic. And um, which was, well, the people that are using us the most and getting the most out of it are not engineers. So when Microsoft who invented the job engineering in theory, or at least, you know, technology engineering, uh, puts out GitHub and says, this thing can write code for you. I think we got to acknowledge now that we're going to need a whole new set of skills and a whole new set of ethics and a whole new set of responsibilities. And I can't tell you that I know what they are. I could just tell you that what we have will not suffice. Dan, I, just on this, and I know we're just around time, in this new world of education that you're describing, which feels a bit more skills-based, vocational training for everybody available to them, to their door, is there still room for the serendipity, the magic, the liberal arts guy who got out of school and had an exceptional career that he never could have envisioned and maybe didn't even know what classes he should have been taking or you know, in this future world? Well, Wills, you may want to edit this out, but 62% of the people that go to college degree are women. So the question is, <laughs> is there room for a person, whatever they believe in, um, guy, woman, whatever you may choose to identify as? And the answer is, of course, yes. There's always a need for people to think. By guy, I meant you, like the guy. I know. No, I understand, Wills. I'm just having fun with you. Um, <laughs> If you're asking, is there a need for people to think, to develop policy, um, to make decisions, to motivate people, to encourage people, um, to decide, do you want the algorithm to point at this or point at that, um, to humanize the capability of technology, I think in some ways more than ever. Um, because if the goal is to eliminate opinion um, or thought or perspective. I mean, the people inventing AI are people. And so therefore, there was a need for them. And there is a need for them now in terms of what are you pointed at? I mean, the, the fight between Elon and Sam is sort of fascinating over whether it's a woke AI or a non-woke AI. And what that shows you is there's always going to be bias in all of these things, because it's what you choose to train it on. The capability is agnostic, but what you train it on is not agnostic. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's need for communication, for collaboration, for decision-making, for encouragement, for, um, for invention, all of these things. This thing is not going to figure out how to invent cancer drugs without the input of people. 
So I think liberal arts is extraordinarily valuable. But again, I would I I've always articulated that what liberal arts was always about was about critical thinking, was about figuring out how to ask good questions, was to figure out how to make decisions, how to communicate to people, how to motivate people, and how to put all of that into a package that takes you from ideation to creation. Um, and But the tools that do that today are very different than the tools that did that. I mean, I remember when I went to London to study for three months and rhetoric was an example of going to Speaker's Corner, which most people don't know what it is anymore in Hyde Park and standing on a box and making your case. Well, what is Speaker's Corner today? It's Twitter. Uh -huh. If you don't know how to use and leverage Twitter or use and leverage any of the technological communication platforms or you're not a a user of creative suites from Adobe and and your job is to create and invent things. It's it's the tools you need to be able to learn tied with the intellect and the communication and the collaboration and the question asking and the critical thinking of liberal arts that makes liberal arts so special. But if you only do one without the other, you're really limiting someone's capability. So your big gripe is that they're just not embracing the tools. My 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 wish is that they sit down and say, what are the modern version of liberal arts? <laughs> Got it. Not that we eliminate liberal arts. I would be devastated if we eliminated liberal arts. Devastated. You know, I'm the son of a school teacher. I went to liberal arts. My kids went to liberal arts. They don't give a shit about coding or engineering. And they hate math. Doesn't make them irrelevant in modern society. But not appreciating what those tools could do will make them irrelevant. And that's my fear, is if we don't reinvent our definition of what is communication, collaboration, critical thinking, um, then how are we really going to raise the next generation of leaders and decision makers? It, you know, Dan, I'm, um, so t t two quick things, and th th we'll wrap it up. As you know, Wills and I had to swim upstream building TIA. Yep. Uh, and one of the ways we tried to position it is as applied liberal arts. You have this great critical thinking engine and TIA, the you know the entrepreneurship program we built, is the transmission that takes that critical thinking and applies it to real world problems to change the world. Yeah. Uh, so so my, my final question to you, you, you've spent a big part of your life as a leader and I've jotted down so many you know great quotes that just came out in this conversation. But I'm wondering if if you could put a sign up in your office behind where you sit, so everybody who walks in that office would see that sign, that, you know, whether it's a sentence or two or something like that, what would you want that sign to be when they walk into the Dan Rosenzweig office, something that kind of, you know, whether it's your motto, your epitaph, something you want these guys to embody? And get well, the sign I would put up is go see Springsteen live. But um, but the reason for that, or Taylor Swift live, by the way, because I, I see Taylor as the modern version of Bruce, which is you're living life, it's not easy, but you're in charge of your own life. Um, and so, you know, she's got a song off her new album, which is you're on your own kid and you always have been. At the end of the day, I guess I'd say you're responsible for your own choices and your own actions. And if you don't accept that about yourself, then you'll always feel like you're a victim. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't victims and it doesn't mean that there aren't systemic problems with our government, our, our financial system, uh, our people, our biases. But there's no place in the world that gives people the opportunity like this country does, despite our flaws, and we have them. But if you look and you say, in the last hundred years, every great invention has come out of the United States of America. It's not necessarily by somebody that was born in America, by the way. It's the system and the culture 
and the belief that you can have a dream, you can convince somebody to back you, and that it could actually happen, that I think I would like people to remember that, you know, to use a lot of Springsteen quotes, which is, again, everything that I would do, which is, you know, you've been broken and you've been hurt. Show me somebody who ain't. I know I'm nobody's bargain, but hey, a little touch up and a little paint, which means, you know what? We all feel a victim of some kind and trying to say yours is worse or better than someone else's doesn't really get you anywhere. The fact is, it's how we try to overcome them. That is the, the journey of life that I would like people to embark on because if you overcome them, you can show other people how to overcome them, right? It's, there, there's, the finish line is death, I guess. Um, and so, but even if you look at Bruce's newest songs, right, Ghost, um, which is the whole song is about, even though people in my life have left me and two members of the band have died, that we're just gonna keep rocking no matter how old we are, and then we're gonna keep playing on the other side. It's that energy that I want us all to believe in, which is giving up gets you nowhere. Getting up gives you a chance to go somewhere. Oh, that's I like that. In the end, we're just all dancing in the dark. I'll tell you, man, um, even if I'm all good, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be sitting around and talk about glory days. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it is what it is, meaning we own our own destiny. We own our own life. You are on your own, kid. You always have been. But it doesn't mean that other people don't want to be part of your life. Let them in. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be part of other people's lives. You want to. Nobody succeeds on their own. We can fail on our own because at the end of the day, failure is quitting and no one can make us quit. That's a choice we have to make. People could try to make us quit and they do every day. There's a whole subset of, of the world and the community um, that prefers to be anonymous and bring people down. I, I can't be that. Don't want to be that. Don't want my kids to be that. Don't want to be around those people. We all have people in our life that we know that when they walk in the room, we go, Ugh. fire those people from your life. Surround yourself with people that come in the room. You're like, things are going to get better. I don't know how, but they are. And I, otherwise, it, the journey's a bitch. <laughs> it just is. But it's also the magic. The magic is the journey, and you can't know it till you get to our age, right? You can't know it. You know, somebody asked me for advice. I was like, I don't give advice because I wouldn't take my own advice. What I could share is wisdom. And all wisdom is, is having lived enough years to have made enough decisions, to have made enough mistakes, to survive them, to live another day and be honest about the story. And so people pass wisdom down to me and it's helped me. And if this in any small way helps people with some of the wisdom or experiences I've had, great. Um, but it's your life to live. So the choices are yours. You can give in to the naysayers. You can give in to the people that make you feel bad. You can give in to the people that want to succeed at your expense. Or you can turn around and chart your own path believe in yourself and surround yourself with people that truly believe in you and want you to succeed. And I've been fortunate that most of the professional people in my life and all of the personal people in my life actually get up and root for me. And I root for them in ways that will make no sense to you. Um, and why I root for them or who I choose to root for is really confusing to me. But I think it's about positivity and energy. Dan, you've been immensely generous with your time and your uh, insights. And the nicest thing I heard, to be honest, was that you put you and I into the same age co cohort, which I'm <laughs> going to I'm going to take that to the bank. Um, <laughs> well, you've achieved more because you've been around more, but I'll keep working until I get to you. Oh, man, man. S seriously. So uh, this was uh, I like to say it's like a brand muffin, you know, a tough but nourishing. Um, R really good. You know, I've been called a lot of things in my life, Andy. <laughs> a brand muffin, 
I'm going to think about what that means to me. <laughs> no, all good. Really, uh, number one, great seeing you again. Uh, you guys, and thanks for the work that you do with young people because it, because the future is predicated on what they believe in and the most important thing to believe in is yourself. Dan, thank you so much. This was such a, a inspirational way to end the week. Uh, Namaste, you. gentlemen. Really appreciated the time and um, let us know what you need next. Excellent. Take care. Thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed talking to Dan. If so, and you'd like to find many more like it, please visit our website.